Uh, I'm Sharon Squassoni, and I'm a senior fellow, and I direct the um, Proliferation Prevention Program here at CSIS. And I'm so pleased you could join us this morning um, for our event on new nuclear suppliers. We have, um, I have a few administrative announcements, but we have <clears throat> kind of an interesting format. This morning, we're going to hear presentations um, from myself and the other speakers, uh, and then we're going to break for coffee, and then we're going to really get into the discussion. So make a note of your questions and comments, and uh, I can assure you uh, that we are going to have a lively discussion. So um, this uh, event this morning, first of all, t turn your ringers off on your cell phones. <laughs> this is on the record. Um, and uh, let me just take a moment to thank um, the staff, our staff, terrific staff, who, who have helped out with this, because I always forget at the end of the program. So Bobby Kim uh, and Jake Greenberg and Jacob Usman um, from the Proliferation Prevention Program and also our external relations program uh, guys who make all of this uh, very seamless. I also want to thank our partners in this project. So um, this is a part of a larger project called Sustainable Nuclear Futures. It was funded a three-year project by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, but we couldn't have done this without our foreign partners. So in New Delhi, it was the Observer Research Foundation. In Korea, it was the Asan Institute. And in China, it was the China Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. So um, we have two publications on your um, chairs. One is kind of a <clears throat> report from the workshops themselves, and the other one is the kind of background paper. My presentation this morning, I'm going to kind of go into the background of this project. Why are we here? What, you know, what is responsible nuclear supply? That kind of thing. But first, what I would like to do is introduce all my speakers. Um, so uh, I'm very, very pleased to have uh, Chris Skidomsky, Alan Hansen, and Gretchen Hund here today. Um, I think, Alan, you deserve the prize for traveling, <laughs> I don't know how many thousands of miles. Uh, Alan came to all the workshops in uh, Delhi and Seoul and Beijing. Gretchen joined us um, in Korea. And Chris is here because he is one of the leading experts on uh, nuclear supply. So after I give a short presentation, uh, Chris will kind of set the context for us. Uh, Alan will talk about the, um, his experiences at the workshops. Gretchen will also, as well as talk about her work in corporate uh, governance. Chris um, is the head of research um, for nuclear issues at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and um, he's had a, a long, illustrious career uh, at a variety of um, regional and multinational firms, including the UN Development Program, the World Bank, Department of Energy, um, and in 2005, he joined the faculty at NYU Center for Global Affairs. So we're really pleased to have you here with us today. Alan Hansen uh, is the executive director of the International Nuclear Leadership Education Program at MIT. Uh, some of you may know Alan from his years as a senior executive at Arriva, and he's an MIT uh, grad, as is Gretchen, um, who is a senior scientist and leader of the policy and analysis team at the Global Security Technology and Policy Group at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. That's almost more than, <laughs> it's quite a mouthful, more than when I describe who I am. Uh, but Gretchen is uh, fantastic. She has over 25 years of experience addressing topics that combine science, technology, and public policy. So um, without further ado, I'm going to launch into just a quick description of uh, kind of to give you the substantive context of what we're talking about today. This project started back in 2010, and so we were thrown a little bit for a loop with Fukushima. <laughs> and uh, so one of the qu questions we first started to um, address was, all right, after Fukushima, what, is, what do we mean by responsible nuclear supply? 
And so this is sort of an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Why do we need responsible nuclear supply? And then how do you approach it? You can approach it at the vendor level, at the government level, and the multinational and international level. So the conventional wisdom is everything works, right? Nuclear suppliers, they follow their government regulations, and that's fine. Um, and, it, and it's a free market out there. Well, anybody in the nuclear business knows that it's not really a free market, that government policies have a huge impact. Um, I, some of you I recognize from the meetings, the nuclear meetings yesterday at the Atlantic Council where we heard about um, the, the new or <laughs> revamped US policy related to nuclear cooperation agreements. Those kinds of government policies have a big impact on what happens around the world. On the other side of it, the suppliers themselves make their choices based on their risk assessments. And the recipients themselves um, can increase or reduce the risks. And so my going in thesis was that responsible nuclear supply requires efforts by everybody, by the governments, by the suppliers, by the recipients. Um, so is there a universal definition? No, <laughs> of responsible nuclear supply. But since Fukushima, there's been increasing talk of nuclear governance. We need better nuclear governance, right? And so what does that apply to? Safety, security, um, you know, non-proliferation. Um, and we have a, a lot of pieces of the puzzle in place, uh, but I still think that we could do more. All right, so my own definition, and this is part of the discussion paper, which you have, uh, and this is what we took around the world with us. Um, how would we define responsible nuclear supply? Well, it minimizes or it doesn't increase the risks of the release of radiation to the environment, people, or society. This is a very, very broad definition. And it would cover not just um, you know, nuclear safety, but it would also cover the nuclear security aspects. So it could be an accident, it could be you know, theft, um, sabotage, and so it would cover all non-proliferation nuclear security and nuclear safety. Is this possible after Fukushima? Um, well, Fukushima obviously wouldn't have been prevented by better nuclear governance. Um, but the, the system has changed. And I know Chris is gonna, going to get into more detail about how the nuclear industry and the markets have changed since uh, Fukushima. Some suppliers are going to get out of the game. Some suppliers have already gotten out of the game. Uh, there may be new suppliers. And that's what we're focusing on today. What will happen um, with South Korea as a supplier, potentially China, and potentially India. One of the big question is what, how will the nuclear newcomers, such as Vietnam and the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, how will they approach um, their uh, nuclear construction and, and deployment? Uh, will they be as constrained as the traditional uh, nuclear power operators by public opinion? Um, Will they have to, you know, they're starting in a lot of ways, starting afresh with their regulatory systems. So that's one of the questions we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, I think this is my last slide. The bottom line is, um, if we want nuclear energy for the future, it has to be sustainable. And in order to be sustainable, we have to make sure that we're doing all the right things in nuclear safety, nuclear security, and um, on fuel cycle issues where we're looking at sensitive nuclear technologies, enrichment and reprocessing for non-proliferation reasons. And I would suggest to you today, and I would love to hear your comments on um, uh, that this requires all stakeholders to reduce the risks. So with that, um, I'm going to skip over these things. These are in your, oh no, I have a longer presentation here. Um, this is in the publications that you've had, um, but we sort of took a kind of leveled approach, uh, different kinds of things that vendors could do, that governments could do, that multilateral and international uh, groups, including <coughs> the nuclear suppliers group, 
to do. We have kind of a menu of uh, recommendations um, at the vendor level. You know, it's not just the nuclear principles that the Carnegie Endowment has been uh, promoting, but also specifically some things that dual-use exporters can do in voluntary actions. Gretchen will talk a little bit more about this. Um, on the unilateral and bilateral approaches by governments, um, you know, there are issues about export promotion and what nuclear cooperation agreements uh, should include. Should some of them go beyond the nuclear suppliers group uh, requirements? Should we get all nuclear suppliers to require the additional protocol as a condition for supply? Um, and what are the role of fuel cycle assurances? And then finally, on the international approaches, um, there are things, additional things that could be done within the nuclear suppliers group, requiring the additional protocol, for example, as a condition of supply. A lot more transparency <laughs> between countries on what these nuclear cooperation agreements include. I mean, and one example is uh, this issue of prior consent for enrichment and reprocessing. Uh, you know, we didn't do it with the UAE, but when you look at the South Korean agreement, they actually did give the UAE prior consent for enrichment and reprocessing, which is kind of funny because the UAE said it wouldn't enrich and reprocess. So I think there could be more harmonization there. Um, I am a big fan of uh, promoting multinational voluntary approaches, for example, making enrichment facilities open uh, to foreign investment, having more multinational enrichment and reprocessing um, or storage and waste um, uh, test, test, test. approaches. And then finally, um, this question of the fissile material production cutoff treaty. I think there's a way, and we can talk about this more in the Q&A, for uh, bringing in some nuclear fuel cycle approaches into that very, very moribund uh, negotiation, which hasn't gone anywhere in about 20 years. Okay, so that those are the end of my slides. I'm, I would, uh, I'm gonna give the floor over to Chris. Um, and set this up for you. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon, and uh, it's a pleasure to come down to, uh, uh, to CSIS to uh, talk about um, one of my favorite topics, um, you know, what's going on in the nuclear world. It's very disconcerting that my colleagues have abandoned me <laughs> in my presentation. This is something that they know that I don't know. Uh, well, I always do that. end of the show we don't want. The, um, thank you. Okay, I guess this is. There we go. So uh, technology can always confound. Uh, Every time I come to Washington and introduce myself as Bloomberg, uh, people freak out and run out of the room because they think I'm part of a news organization. Uh, I am part of a news organization, but New Energy Finance was founded by a bunch of ex-McKinsey consultants uh, in London in 2004, 2005. Uh, I uh, joined them uh, several years ago specifically to help them understand what's going on in the nuclear power industry. Um, we have 12 offices scattered around the world, and um, these are the markets that we serve. Our mandate is to provide the best information, the best data, the best intelligence on clean energy, carbon-free markets, uh, water, and increasingly natural gas because of the impact it has 
on renewable energy development. I'm going to break down my talk into three specific areas. We're going to talk about the changing dynamic power markets, uh, economic challenges fa facing nuclear power plants, and talks uh, briefly about the new suppliers. So this is the growth that we're looking at in certain parts of the world. In the US, it's relatively flat. But in other parts of the world, specifically China, huge amount of growth. Look at India, tremendous amount of growth. Even Australia, almost doubling their, their generation capacity in the next few years. So it's not surprising, therefore, when you look at where are the nuclear power plants that are under construction today, where they're located. They're primarily located in Asia, followed by Europe, which includes Russia, and much less in the Americas. There are other regions in the world where the growth in demand for electricity is skyrocketing. One of those is the Middle East. This is the type of data we collect, the type of data we disseminate. And as we can see here, you know, year on year, 5% for the region between 2010 and 2020. When I was in uh, Abu Dhabi last month to talk to the, uh, the management of ENEC, the Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, they said that demand in the country is going up 9% a year. When you're faced with such great demand, you need to build nuclear power plants and you need to build them quickly, in which is what they are going ahead and doing. There is another very, very important driver in the Middle East in that there's a tremendous amount of oil still being used for generate electricity. If you go around and add all of that up, in these five countries that amounts to 246 terawatt hours of electricity generated by oil, which if you assume a 90% capacity factor, which is perhaps a little bit high, that translates to 31 gigawatts of nuclear power opportunity. When you look at the Saudis, the Saudis are using a transfer price of $5 to price their fossil fuels. There's an opportunity cost price of oil today about 100 bucks, so there's a big disparate difference. The Saudis have said that if they don't build nuclear power plants by 2028, due to the increasing demand for electricity inside the country for domestic use, for desalination of water, they are not going to have any oil for export markets, which really places the stability of, that, of the kingdom perhaps in jeopardy. So my boss always bugs me. He says, Chris, what's the cost of a nuclear power plant? I say, listen, you can take your pick. You want the vendor costs, you want the owner's costs, the overnight costs, or the all-in financing. This is very, very important to understand because when you look at nuclear uh, costs for nuclear power plants, it can get very, very confusing what's included and what's not including, and it's important to get an assessment. So therefore, going from left to right in Japan and finishing up with the Hinkley Sea, these are done on date of first concrete, date of anticipated first concrete for the last two projects in the right. You can see there's a definite trend of price increasing for nuclear power plants. Now, many people will say that, you know, this Hinkley C project in the, in the UK is a ridiculous project. It's very, very expensive. It's not going to work. It's so expensive. And so if you go ahead and even take out that project, you still see there is a significant increase in the price over time, over the last few years, of prices for nuclear power plants trending upwards. We'll talk about the significance of this in a little while. If, however, you introduce a new supplier like the Chinese, this is a vendor cost, I assume, because the Chinese have a very, very lack of transparency in as far as their pricing concerned. You see that curve flattening out. This is for a 2200 megawatt facility, first of a kind technology, an older technology that the Chinese are trying to sell or are in the process of selling or negotiating to build in Karachi. Another challenge for the nuclear energy industry is we can generate carbon-free electricity with nuclear. We can also do it with renewables. Ironically, if you look at this graph, when did investment in the nuclear energy or renewable energy industry peak? Right around Fukushima, and has ironically declined. This is based on a regional basis. Every single quarter we collect this data. 
This is it on a technology basis, okay? So we see a great predominance of yellow indicating solar. There's a lot more solar being done and being built around the world, which is significant for a variety of different reasons. And it's caused by the, the, the continued price trend of lower and lower costs for installed PV. So if you have a central PV, the levelized cost of electricity is declining in contrast to the, to the price of electricity we saw from nuclear power plants, which the initial capital cost is increasing here. This is a comparison of PV with other technologies on a global basis, US China coal, US combined cycle gas turbine, which is kind of really ridiculous right now because of the press prices of natural gas, but it gives you an idea on a global basis. If you compare this to the UK strike price, the price of electricity that the government has guaranteed to buy electricity from the Hinkley C nuclear power plant starting in 2020 or so, whenever it's coming online, 2023, you know, all of these are cost competitive. That's something for us to pay a little bit of attention to. I must confess, I live in the desert in Southern California. There's a tremendous amount of solar insulation. I live in one of those red dot areas. And as a result of that, I bought my solar PV system in 2006, way ahead of the curve, and paid a premium for doing so. But I did it because Governor Schwarzenegger said he'd pay for part of it. So I said, well, I'll take that deal. But if you look around the world, the places in the, where solar rooftop PV is becoming competitive with the grid increases, increases, increases. So now there is an alternative as a homeowner it's cheaper for me to buy a PV system than to be plugged into the grid. This is an important thing for regards to demand erosion and forecasting the future of nuclear power plants, other base load. It's a very disruptive technology. It's, it's a big wave in the industry that all of us need to be cognizant of if we're thinking about seriously studying what's going on over here. So <clears throat> last month, I was in Abu Dubai. <clears throat> New country, new site, new supplier. This is the first time the Koreans have embarked on an international export sale of a reactor. Um, you can pick me out dead center of that photograph. I am standing behind people from Oman, people from Sudan, people from Saudi Arabia, people from Vietnam, people from uh, other parts of Africa. All of these people, there were, of the 27 people who were there, 17 different countries, many of them are looking to investigate new opportunities for nuclear power in their countries. This project, unlike projects in the UK, and in, 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 unlike projects in Europe, and in, to a lesser extent the US, is on budget, and it is on schedule, and uh, relatively competitive, and uh, it's a great place to go ahead and visit. I was very privileged to go and, and see what's going on there. The Koreans are working very, very hard to make sure this comes on, on time, on budget. This is the first of four projects in the current contract. The site is 30 kilometers by three kilometers, big enough to handle 12 nuclear power plants. And it's unclear at this stage when or if they'll expand to the full thing. This is relatively close to the Saudi border. So if we look now, at the distribution of reactors under construction by origin, this is how it breaks down. I'm missing one reactor somewhere, but I think it's probably not gonna change the dynamics too much. If we were to go ahead 10 years, the question we need to ask ourselves is how are the proportions are going to change? So starting from the top right, US, Japan, well, allegedly the Chinese are going to build eight more additional AP1000, so that number will go from 13 to 21. Okay, uh, Korea is going to build at least two more reactors in the uh, United Arab uh, Emirates. They're going from six to eight, assuming they don't build any more. France, um, they have two EPRs built under construction in Europe, two in, in, in China. They're going ahead and they're gonna probably build one or two more, two more in, in, in the UK. So that's numbers increasing. The Russians are very, very aggressive. They have a, a, a contract with, with Turkey, they have negotiations with Vietnam, they are negotiations with Jordan, Bangladesh. Uh, we can anticipate that they will go ahead and increase their percentage of that. 
India um, is in fact a buyer of technology, they would like more technology. In their country, they're having a struggle in whether or not to use domestic technology or to acquire uh, international technology, and there's a debate that's gonna play out. The Chinese, we've already seen, planning to sell two reactors to Pakistan. How successful they become in exporting technology over the long term remains to be seen. However, we'll come back to that particular point. When I was in uh, Abu Dhabi last month, I got the impression that it's such a lavish program, the technology is so expensive, that few countries in the world can go ahead and, and take, have the luxury of investing in nuclear. Perhaps Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. The Russians have said, well listen, there's a lot of countries that we can sort of help, so they're devising this build, own, operate technology where they will build it, own it, operate, and you pay for electricity and for the water that's generated if there is any water that's desalinated from that. This precludes the necessity of a tremendous capital investment by the local country, and um, it will be something that's underdeveloped now. It's unclear what impact and how many of these plants the Russians will be able to go, but it's an alternative strategy that exists that they're having some success with. <clears throat> Poland. In the area of concern about climate change, they're getting about 90% of their electrical power from coal. They don't want to buy more Russian gas. They don't have a strong solar resource. They have some wind. So what does a country like Poland do, okay? Well, this is their plan to add capacity, add nuclear capacity in the top. They are horrified at the prospect of doing so because it's a huge investment. They're a non-nuclear country. And the, the debate going on is, do we really want to invest in this? And if so, which technology, which vendor do they choose? Do they uh, choose a European vendor like Ariva EDF, the EPR, has had fantastic cost overruns in, uh, in, in, the, in the Europe? Do they chi ch choose a, a Chinese um, um, partner? Who knows? Do they choose a, an American-Japanese partner like GE Hitachi or uh, Toshiba Westinghouse? Probably so. They're really up in air, so trying to decide what type of technology they'll deploy when. Hopefully, the decision was going to be made by the end of this year. It will be a big surprise if that, in fact, happens. This is our projection from Bloomberg New Energy Finance of what the generation portfolio is going to be in the UK in the next 20 years, okay? We see nuclear uh, maintaining a small and growing percentage of that market, yet they need to close all of their nuclear reactors by 2022, so they're going to have an aggressive new build. The Chinese are interested in fi being financial investors. The question then becomes to us, if the Chinese become financial investors, at what point do they become suppliers of technology? Unknown, it'd be very interesting to watch what goes on over there. <clears throat> Before uh, leaving for this event yesterday, a colleague of Bloomberg told me, you know, it's a shame that the nuclear power industry is in such the doldrums. So I always tell him, you know, we've had Fukushima, we have record low gas prices, <laughs> and we got five nuclear power plants under construction in this country. I think we're really doing well, and the rest of the world is really, really growing. The question that we need to ask is how does that look between 2020 and 2030? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, Alan? Bobby, we'll help you get your slides. Thanks very much, Bobby. Well, good morning. Um, as uh, Sharon indicated in uh, her introduction, uh, I got the prize for the most frequent flyer miles uh, attending uh, the workshops. And uh, I actually got a lot more than, the, than just those miles because it was a, it was a very instructive in experience uh, to visit a number of countries, uh, some which I had visited before, others uh, for the first time. And uh, I'm going to try to just give you a brief overview of some of the impressions I came back with rather than reiterate the, the discussions that we had there. You can read some very good summaries that CSIS has prepared that describes uh, what went on uh, at the workshops. 
So I'm going to march through them um, uh, one by one. Uh, the first place that we went was uh, India. And it was very convenient that the workshop was organized to follow a, the first WNA, World Nuclear Association uh, India Nuclear Conference, uh, which I also got to attend. And uh, that conference gave us a very, very good uh, technical background on uh, what uh, is being done in India, what they plan to do. And then we moved into uh, the workshop, uh, which included some people who were not involved uh, in uh, the WNA, but some who also were. Uh, but my biggest impression, the strongest one, was how proud the Indian nuclear establishment is that they managed to survive uh, a boycott uh, by the Western world uh, because of their uh, nuclear tests and that they have what they believe is a thriving, growing uh, nuclear indigenous industry. And it really is indigenous. It's quite uh, unique uh, from uh, what we do uh, in the West. And what's unfortunate is that uh, the fact that they have developed this in indigenous technology has left uh, the West with relatively little influence with regard to how they behave. And uh, we have been very fortunate from that from a non-proliferation point of view, outside of their own proliferation, they have been uh, sterling performers. <coughs> Now, we found out in the workshop that uh, there is some domestic opposition to what they're doing, but it's on an individual basis. There's not a, a real uh, coherent, organized opposition uh, yet. And although the Russians had some trouble opening the first power plant in Kundan Kulam, uh, they eventually did get it open uh, over a, a large amount of uh, local protests. But in the end, <clears throat> the major lesson is that India is not ready to do exports on any grand scale. Uh, they certainly can export components. They are doing it already. Uh, the company that I used to lead, Transnuclear, uh, is uh, building containers at Larsen and Tubro uh, in India, and those containers are coming to the United States for use. They are high quality, ASME, NQA1 uh, qualified containers, so the Indians can make the components. But what else would they, uh, they export? They have pressurized heavy water reactors, which they know the technology very well. Uh, do we want them to export those? Uh, I think for the people in this room, the answer is quite clearly no. And, I, and the reason to me is very simple. When the US negotiated the, uh, the agreement with India, fully half of the operating PHWRs in India are outside of the agreement which means they're part of the military establishment. So these machines are ideal for producing weapons grade material. And I would not personally, I'm speaking on my personal cognizance here, I would not want to see these exported to other countries because of what they can be used for. Uh, what else have they uh, developed? They've uh, developed uh, uh, indigenous reprocessing that's uh, apparently working quite well uh, because it's producing enough material for them to have a fairly robust nuclear weapons program. Do we want them to export that? Clearly no. And what else do they have? Uh, they're uh, getting involved in, uh, in fast reactors. They're one of the few places that has uh, a, a, a pretty good test program in fast reactors. And since these are plutonium-based reactors, would we like to see those exported? And the answer to that is, is pretty much no as well if you're concerned about nonproliferation. So outside of exporting components, uh, India does not have things that they can export that are going to uh, develop a lot of revenue for them without causing, I think, proliferation concerns in other places in the world. Now, the good thing is that they are so wrapped up in their own domestic program, which needs to grow dramatically, that I don't see them aggressively moving to do uh, export uh, in the near term. So I view India as being pretty far in the future with regard to becoming a new supplier. When they do so, I certainly hope that they will be uh, responsible in the way that they do it. Next, we went to Korea. Totally different story. Uh, the Koreans, uh, as you've just heard, uh, have been successful at home with their nuclear power program. They have one of the biggest domestic programs in the world. Uh, they gained success by making the sale to the United Arab Emirates, uh, their first export. And as Chris just mentioned, they are executing right now 
reportedly uh, on time and budget. Uh, it remains to be seen because one of the things I learned building things in my career was you don't know what it costs until you finish building it. And so uh, it remains to be seen whether uh, they will in fact uh, stay on budget. And it also uh, remains to be seen whether they budgeted a, a loss leader or uh, really intended to make any money on this project. We'll just have to wait and see. But if they are successful with the UAE project, uh, then I think that that opens the door for them in, uh, in a lot of other places uh, in the world because it will demonstrate uh, their reliability uh, and it will also uh, put cost pressure on other vendors because the price at which they have sold those reactors is, is very, very competitive. So the whole world's watching, the whole nuclear world is watching this project to see uh, how they uh, execute. However, this, this was not on our watch. This did not happen uh, uh, before um, our workshop. But for those of you who followed uh, the nuclear trade press, the Republic of Korea has gotten caught up in, uh, in a really bad uh, nuclear scandal with regard to falsification of documentation associated with uh, their own reactors. Uh, and this problem turns out to be a lot larger than I think anybody anticipated that it would be. I'm not going to argue that there are real safety consequences associated with the falsifications because many of these issues, some of which have occurred in other places in the world, are usually documentation issues. But the inability to maintain strict honesty and verbatim compliance to procedures and, uh, and documents is an early warning with regard to the integrity of your supplier and their ability to really do what it is that they say they're going to do. To my mind, this is a very, very big black eye. Um, it is certainly hurting them domestically with many of their reactors shut down. Uh, there are people who are going to jail uh, over this issue, some of them very senior people. The real question remains, will the brand be tarnished so that people will not trust them as uh, a reliable supplier? Uh, and the other one is, will they reform uh, so that this kind of an issue doesn't take place in the future. And uh, the second one is, uh, is, is really uh, the, the biggest concern. Because if you, when you're in a hurry to do something, and you're, you, if you're truly budget and schedule conscious, and you put that consideration above safety and above verbatim compliance, then you cut corners, which is how they got to uh, where the, they did uh, in Korea. Uh, it's my understanding that the International Oversight Committee that uh, the Emirates have created for uh, seeing their program has uh, brought this problem to the attention of uh, the Emirates, and the Emirates are trying to get the assurances that they need that, in fact, this kind of, uh, of data falsification will not take place with the material that's exported. So, uh, this, again, the situation is uh, very different from, from India. Here we have a successful exporter, a new supplier, what remains to be seen is uh, will they do it responsibly because falsification of documents is right at the top of the list of irresponsible behavior. Finally, we went to, uh, to China. And uh, China is another interesting situation, uh, quite different from the previous two. Uh, we arrived on, a, on an unusual day. Uh, it, it had rained the day before, and uh, the sun was out. There's a blue sky. And I thought, gee, this is, this, this is pretty good. I went to bed, and the next morning I got up, and I couldn't see the building uh, next to the, the hotel. And I understood very dramatically why they need and why they want nuclear power. For anybody who has not been to, to Beijing, uh, you, you, you really don't understand what pollution is. So that was the, the first lesson I took away, and we didn't, we didn't, need the, we didn't do that in the workshop. Uh, but you saw from, uh, from what Chris showed you, that they've got the, the biggest and fastest growing program uh, in the world. Uh, it's quite dramatic, and the, the, the good thing about that from the perspective of export is they are so busy domestically that their focus at the moment is not on, uh, on export. They have so much to do domestically uh, that I don't see them uh, diverting resources to a large scale export program at least over the next few years. It's clearly on their mind uh, going forward, uh, but I think we're going to be seeing quite a period of time before they, uh, they jump into the market in the same way that the Koreans have. In that regard, I consider that the, uh, the, uh, the deal under discussion with Pakistan is an anomaly. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's being negotiated because uh, China is probably the only country in the world who would export something uh, to Pakistan. Uh, they believe that because they had uh, exported reactors there uh, prior to their joining the uh, NSG, that uh, their contractual dealings uh, with Pakistan are grandfathered. Uh, I don't think that there is a consensus within the nuclear suppliers group that that in fact is true. But nonetheless, uh, China is planning to move ahead and export more technology to, uh, to Pakistan. They are the only uh, major uh, potential supplier that has not signed up to the principles of conduct uh, which have been uh, put together, uh, uh, midwifed by, by Carnegie. And Sharon had a, had a role in that as well, and I, I really congratulate Carnegie on what they've done. However, uh, those principles are just that, they're principles. Uh, you, you would like to think that there is such a thing as a code of conduct, uh, but in the negotiations, the word code implies legal constraints, which some of the suppliers, primarily Russia, were unwilling to uh, sign up to. And so uh, you end up with principles, which are very nice, but there is voluntary compliance with those principles. I would like to think that all of the companies that signed up to the principles will comply uh, with them, uh, and I, I think that they probably will. But then you go through and you read the details, and you, get, you see phrases like, uh, the vendor shall seek to, and that's very easy. I mean, you can seek to do something just by asking somebody to do it, and if they say no, you've still complied with the principles, and they go off and do whatever they want to do. And so it's, it's a really a, a, a relatively weak foundation document. It's a, it's a good thing, don't get me wrong there. But if it's going to have uh, real teeth, then it could uh, do even more than it does right now. But I don't see the vendor community prepared to put teeth into that document. I also suspect that one of the reasons that China did not sign up to this was uh, with a vision to uh, the Pakistan uh, sale, because if you read the principles, I think it would be very difficult for making the case that uh, you can res resp resp responsibly supply uh, to Pakistan. Finally, when it comes to uh, export, uh, the reactors going to Pakistan, presumably, um, they will be first of a kind, but they're still really generation two reactors. They're built off on antiquated technology, good technology, but it's not at the forefront of what's being supplied uh, in the world today. Uh, they are bound by their agreement with Westinghouse uh, that they cannot uh, export the AP-1000 reactors, which they're building, uh, without uh, uh, further discussions, shall we say, uh, with Westinghouse. And so one of the things that they're doing is they're developing their own indigenous uh, reactors, uh, obviously borrowing from the technologies that they've uh, learned from around the world, from the French and from uh, the Japanese and from the Canadians and from the Russians and from Westinghouse, from everybody. When they have an indigenous technology, I suspect that that is what they will be selling because at that point they are free of the constraints that would come with exporting technology which had any uh, connection uh, whatsoever uh, with the United States. And so uh, we will eventually see uh, the, uh, the, the, the Chinese exporting. Uh, when they do so, again, I hope that they will be uh, rigorous about uh, uh, stepping up to being responsible. Uh, but to my mind, the, the, the Pakistan situation raises some questions in my mind with regard to how stringent they'll really be. So those are some of the impressions and some of the things I came back with. And finally, there's a place we didn't go. And uh, this is uh, the elephant in the room and or in the, the world nuclear community. And Chris has talked a little bit about this. Uh, this is a, a timing sequence here. The UAE deal by Korea was unique. It's the only uh, sale which Korea has made outside of, uh, of their peninsula so far. If we take a look at the situation of, in Turkey, which, uh, which Chris mentioned, this is about the third or fourth time that, uh, that in Turkey they ran a procurement. And on previous occasions, uh, they had been terminated uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, the Western world was quite skeptical of Turkey as a recipient of, uh, of nuclear technology. The last time they ran a procurement, no, they got no bids, zero. 
And uh, th there were a variety of reasons for that. Every vendor had its own reason for choosing not to, uh, to make an offer uh, to Turkey. But I think, uh, to some extent, it indicates uh, a, uh, a real set of responsible suppliers who were concerned about whether or not Turkey was really ready uh, to do this and was going to do it in the way that it needs to be done to be done right. But since they didn't get any bids, uh, the Russians ran in the next day uh, with the briefcases, <coughs> and before you know, they walked off with a, with a sole source deal under a build, own, operate model that nobody has ever used any place uh, in the world. And you saw the, uh, the, the, the picture of that deal that Chris put up there. Yeah, it's really quite unique. It remains to be seen uh, whether it will work, how it will work. Uh, my understanding is that the actual agreement between Turkey and Rosatom is a relatively short agreement, and there are already some rather uh, interesting discussions about what is in the contract and what is not. And uh, I, I think that uh, the people are going to find out that this model is a lot more complicated and difficult to implement than uh, it appears on the face of it. But soon after that, uh, what, uh, what do we see next? The Russians were everywhere. I, and I mean everywhere. Any, any country that expressed any interest in nuclear power, Ross Adam was there the next day to, uh, to start talking to them. They have entered into agreements uh, with many countries. The two question marks that I have here are countries, uh, this, these are not really orders here, but these are countries uh, with which, uh, in a matter of weeks, they ended up entering into uh, nuclear cooperation uh, agreements. Now, you can't do that in the United States. This process here uh, take, takes us years, and that would be the truth in, in uh, I think, most other countries that are responsible suppliers. They can do it in a matter of days or weeks. And so that has left them with a, with a very, very commanding uh, situation. The, the cost of nuclear power, as Chris showed us, is, is very, very high, uh, particularly if you do it right. And for those vendors who can bring financing along with their product, they have an incredibly important edge, and that's precisely what Rose Adam is doing. And there's no one else in the world who's in a position uh, to do that, not Korea, not the US, not France, not Japan, and I don't think even China will do that, except for this very special situation in Pakistan. The last order that was placed, this, this is the real shocker. Uh, Jordan is traditionally allied very strongly with the Western world. The fact that they chose uh, Ross Adam in a competition uh, with European and Japanese suppliers uh, it was, I think, a real surprise. Certainly was a surprise to me. I think it came as a surprise to uh, a lot of people. And this was done in a background in which the Jordanians are furious with the Russian government over their behavior in Syria because it's causing a huge refugee problem for them in their own country. Despite that political situation, they still signed up with, with Ross Adam. So um, this is the elephant in, in the room. I, I, I don't really believe that the Russians will uh, follow through and make all of these uh, supply, but some of them are real. Uh, I think Vietnam and Belarus in particular, these projects will, will to my mind, undoubtedly uh, go ahead. Some of the others are uh, quite uh, uh, speculative. Will Russia be a responsible supplier? I think that's an open question as well. Um, if we learn from the Japanese experience, uh, the situation is, is not directly comparable in Russia, but I do not believe that Russia has a truly independent regulator. I think a truly uh, independent regulator um, would find himself in jail the first moment that he uh, caused uh, a problem uh, at the highest levels uh, of the government. So I don't think the independence is there. While the technology that the Russians build is extremely good, uh, I don't question their technology. I, co I question the soft things that go with it with regard to safety culture, independent regulation. Um, if, if I felt that um, I could get on an airplane to any place in Russia and actually land at the, at the place that I'm going, uh, I would feel a lot more comfortable with their, uh, their, their nuclear supply. But unfortunately, uh, the, the, the history there is not particularly good. And it indicates that there is a lack of understanding of what it takes to build a true safety culture, how to do preventive maintenance, uh, what to do about fitness for duty. All of these things that are not hardware are a problem. 
And this is one of the things that we tried to convey when we went around to these workshops. It's not, an, it's not enough to just export the hardware. You have to get the safety culture. You have to do the regulation. You have to do the non-proliferation. You have to do all of these institutional things along with the equipment or you're not a responsible supplier. And I think that's, uh, that's enough said. Uh, and uh, I uh, look forward to uh, the further discussion. With Thank you, Alan. We'll have Gretchen next, and your slide should just be following that. I can just hit this button. This is the easiest way to do it. Keep going. Perfect. There we go. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, well, I can't ask for much better uh, segue than uh, than what Alan just gave me um, with respect to <laughs> teeing up the importance of the non-material or hardware, if you will. Um, as far as really being important. Um, this is going to be kind of my take on it. I, I was only lucky enough to be in one of the three workshops, the one in Korea, um, but, but the understanding and the importance of industry's role in all of this is what I'd like to talk about today. Um, Chris did show us that trends are going up, that it looks like we will see an increase in nuclear power over the next several years, um, even with an accident like Fukushima. But I'd just like to make the point that it's not really a given, you know, that events can happen and things can, can go wrong potentially. And the importance of making sure that there aren't disasters um, and that people are really thinking about how they, back to Alan's point, really looking at how to be responsible and building a culture within these companies at the end of the day is, uh, is really critical. Because you know, reputation matters, and we've heard that from so many um, of the interviews we've done with uh, with companies around the world. And you know, trust is really important, and it comes in different ways. I mean, you de definitely have trust with respect to having your project being on time and on budget. That's really critical. But it's also important, as I said, to making sure that these disasters don't happen and that you have uh, supply chain integrity at, at the end of the day. So looking at corporate culture is, is really important. Um, this is a slide that I've used to try to look at the different steps that companies can take um, and also industries can take to try and look at going beyond compliance or being responsible. And at the far left-hand side, you'll see a code of conduct, uh, maybe even before that, to Alan's point, or, or principles, if you will, uh, and then actually having a code of conduct, working through to having an industry as a whole come up with a code of conduct instead of just individual companies. And then something we'll, we're calling kind of a third party, where you have an industry entity that's really looking to tr provide advice and counsel, and maybe even kind of judgment with respect to how companies are doing. And then you end up in this ISO-like guidance. It doesn't have to be ISO itself, but where there really is this kind of oversight, if you will. Um, and then finally, the gold standard is, um, is having a third party verification with respect um, to ISO. So these are all kinds of steps that one could take. Um, this slide is really trying to look at the fuel cycle as a whole and trying to think about where are all the places where responsible supply or going beyond compliance could occur. And we looked at several different case studies of other industries, and I'm just going to pick two. One is with the cement industry. I personally worked with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and this consortium of cement companies came to them in Geneva and said it's just a matter of time the world's going to figure out that we're the second largest producer of CO2 in the world, and we'd like to figure out how to really get our arms around that and not be that. Um, and we helped them kind of look at different things they could do. Um, and nobody made them do it. They did this on their own. Similarly, um, I'm going to pick the apparel um, with respect to the cotton pledge. This was interesting because um, in Uzbekistan, there's child labor making a lot of this cotton. And so you had the J. Crews and different companies that want to say, hey, suppliers, really be wary that we're not buying, we're making sure we're at, that our cotton is not coming from this place. And there's several other different, um, different case studies that we've done as well. But it's not just these other industries. There are, as you can see from this list of bullets, there's all obviously um, steps in the right direction, if you, if you will, with respect to in the nuclear industry, um, kind of what I call self-regulation. Um, again, not trying to undermine any of the regulations that are on the books. They're all fantastic. This is going beyond what's regulatorily required. The first one Alan uh, responded to, and that's this nuclear power plant exporters' principles of conduct. 
um, that Carnegie did a great job in leading and was published in 2011 and getting the ball rolling with respect to that. You know, second, we have INPO. Um, this was after Three Mile Island. Um, again, you know, industry-led, serves as kind of a third party to make sure they're bringing up the bar that if any of the suppliers aren't doing a great job, excuse me, the nuclear reactors aren't doing a good job, they bring up the, the bar. And then there's WINS, the World Institute of Nuclear Security. Um, this is really looking at guidance and training for all security managers of nuclear material um, across different, different um, elements within the fuel cycle. But it's really kind of third party sharing, not judgmental, really more providing advice, if you will. And then CEEC, this started back in 2011, and so it's pretty new, um, developing kind of this internal compliance program of, of focusing in on export control. Uh, they have industry working groups, provide kind of policy standards, trying to help. You know, these are all really great examples, but there's something missing with all of them. Um, and with, with the Carnegie principles, we're really just focused on the reactors. And as Alan mentioned, I think we could probably go further with respect to what we're trying to get suppliers to do. The same for NPO. Um, it's, it's geographically limited to the United States. And for this to really take hold, we need to have the world kind of um, think that this is important. And with respect to WINS, um, I tease Roger Housley, who I think very highly of, um, the head of WINS. Um, I just would love to see it more than nuclear security. Um, but again, not, not everybody can do everything. I'm not blaming him at all. Um, CEC, um, it's commodities. It's really looking at the precursors, if you will, um, not focused on actually on looking at the entire fuel cycle as well. Um, again, all of these are good examples. Just, you know, I, I kind of want something that's more comprehensive, and, uh, and that's what we've tried to do is look at a way to try to get industry uh, more. And I use the word we, and I would like to give credit to Andrew, Andrew Kerzrock, and the audience who's been my colleague in doing a lot of this work. We published this piece in the bulletin, this uh, May-June article. And what we try to do is come up with a way to get the conversation going. And these are seven metrics that we're putting out there uh, for companies to talk about, and hopefully industries as a whole, to think about how they can go beyond compliance and be able to measure their ability to, uh, to do the right thing, we would say. And what's been fun to look at this is through the lens of um, corporate sustainability. And because a lot of these companies today are writing reports about corporate sustainability, and they're measuring, and they have metrics, and they have to put this out for their shareholders to take, you know, basically to understand. And what's been kind of fun to realize is that this isn't just something they do because it's nice or a good thing to do. I mean, the investment community really cares about this. Uh, the UN has sponsored the Principles for Responsible Investment. And there's actually a thousand different financial services that have signed on to, to the PRI, and collectively it represents um, 30 trillion dollars within the U.S., which is pretty impressive. So this isn't just a nice to; these are important things to do. Um, but right now, there really aren't any metrics for how to look at sustainability by thinking about nonproliferation being a piece of this. But if you think about, it, if you're a company and you're making widgets things that could actually be diverted and used in a nuclear weapon. Why wouldn't you include this in the way you do reporting? I mean, I don't know. It makes sense to me, obviously. <laughs> so when I pre presented these in Korea, um, the first one, corporate governance statement, um, you know, that, that made sense to people as far as an individual company signing on to something, participating in supporting, you know, a code of conduct or a pledge. Again, the Carnegie is, um, uh, approach is, is one step in that direction. This commitment to preferentially choosing business partners, this is an attempt to have kind of what I call the ripple effect. So if you're a company and you end up saying, I'm only going to source material from companies who follow similar requirements that I'm putting on myself, that's a tremendous way to try to, to move the ball forward. Um, we've looked at this next one is policies on um, sharing suspicious trade requests. Here we've looked at um, the possibility of having an independent industry-run third party that actually collects information from companies. Because one thing we have heard in our, in our interviews is, wow, you know, I'm just really not comfortable in sharing these illicit requests. When I get one, I just ball it up and throw it in the trash can, and that's lost intelligence that no one has the opportunity to use. But if they were comfortable in sharing those illicit requests with this third party entity that then could make sure that anybody who's a member of that third party doesn't fill that order that could go a long ways, we're hoping, towards making sure um, that these things aren't happening. 
The number five, participating in a government export control rulemaking example is if you have the Department of Commerce coming out and saying, here's a notice of inquiry. We want to collect information from industry on whether or not we should do X, Y, Z. Just making sure that companies actually do that. Um, and they have their technology advisory committees that uh, industry participates in, uh, which we've presented at, which is also a great way to move uh, things forward. And then nonproliferation training and education for employees. This was an um, interesting one that I ended up getting a response at the Korean workshop. Um, I heard, you know, the, the culture issue within Korea is not great. And this is obviously um, uh, given all the issues, again, that Alan mentioned with respect to these parts um, uh, being forged. I mean, this is really important, training people. And it's not something you do once. <laughs> probably something you want to do every year, every other year, to make sure that people stay, stay crisp and understand what those issues are. And the last one, acknowledging noncompliance. This is something that is done in the environmental sustainability um, business, so that you're comfortable being transparent about something that you know, didn't go perfectly. This is what happened. We did get pushback from some folks saying, hey, we've got INPO. This is done internally. This allows people to report um, without having to the whole world know about it. Um, but again, this is something that is being used in other, um, other industries, so we think it, at least it's worth looking at. But for those companies um, who aren't really taken by the sustainability, you know, seeing the, the, um, the, the interest in doing that, um, maybe they don't value sustainability, or you know, as far as investment, they're a privately held firm, um, it may be necessary to look at incentives. And so this slide is an attempt to try to capture what are those incentives that we could put forth to try and get um, industry to, to take a more uh, proactive uh, role in caring about nonproliferation? And one thing I need to make really, really clear is this list up here is something we have just dreamt up. This is not by any means the U.S. government has come out and said, yes, Gretchen, I agree with all these items. In fact, you know, that's not the case at all. Quite the opposite. Well, not the opposite. But this is just a way to get the conversation going of things that we think you know, we ought to be looking at and have that conversation going. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is when I use the term with industry, when I do these interviews and I say, you know, is it your job to care about nonproliferation? You know, they'll say, well, no, it's really government's job. But if I say, is it your job to secure and really make sure that control all the goods and services throughout your supply chain, is that your job? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So part of it is semantics. Um, so we need to get past that and, uh, and not worry about, um, about the language. So starting on the left-hand side with cost, um, you know, process improvements. Uh, the first one we've got here, licensing certainty. I can't tell you how many times we've heard from companies, you know, if only if I knew, is it going to be two weeks? Is it going to be a month? You know, how long is it going to take for my license to get approved? And if there were programs available where you could guarantee whatever the number it happens to be, you know, that these license decisions are going to happen within a certain amount of time. It would really help companies reduce their financing risks, allow them to make sales more easily. And we kind of use this term, buy American last, you know, because it takes so long getting through the hoops. I mean, that's not what we want for companies. And so that, I think, would be a, a pretty important one. Um, Green Lane, this is kind of teeing off of the US Customs and Border Protection. You know, they have something they call CTPAT, the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. That's typically always been looked at imports, things coming into country. So we're kind of turning things around and saying, what if you had a CT pat, but with exports, as far as things going out the door? Um, that could really help. And you know, there, there are certain benefits could be, you know, the likelihood of being targeted for inspection. Maybe you could get the front line. You get your your um, your goods and services through. As far as inspectors, you'd have you know access to expedited processing, maybe special training. You know, again, these are all things that we've, we've dreamt up, and, and there is a bit of a pilot going on, but I'd love to see that um, mature, if you will. Then the next one is export data flexibility. You know, here's looking at the automated export system. Uh, right now, there's a lot of, you know, boxes you need to check when you're doing your exports, and, and getting all that information collected ahead of time sometimes can be really onerous. And what if the possibility of saying maybe the weight of what I'm trying to ship that's something I don't really know until the minute I'm trying to ship it. What if I could wait 10 days and give you that information later? Is it really, at the end of the day, going to make a huge difference from the standpoint of being able to, to know that this is a valid export? Probably not. So if there are ways to look at being more flexible, that's what that one's going after. 
And then lower overhead expenses, you know, tax credits. You know, we've met with companies and we've said, well, you know, the government is giving energy efficient appliances. You get a tax credit for these kinds of things. You know, what if you had a tax credit for export awareness training? Back to the importance of training. You know, what if you had, you had a compliance software to look at lists of who in fact are, um, are on the list and making sure that those kinds of lists and ways to use those lists could be somehow you get a tax rate off or purchasing that is something you could um, not have to handle with respect to the company. It could get covered. Um, and then interagency reciprocity. Sometimes, you know, there's so many different parts of the U.S. government that are involved in export control. And if you as a company are helping one entity or one part of the U.S. government, making sure that that is known across to the other ones, um, so having some kind of reciprocity could be important. Maybe you're getting credit um, for supporting nonproliferation mission, you know, throughout uh, the interagency instead of just that one, one part of the, um, with the U.S. government. And then on the right-hand side, this differentiation with respect to market advantage, you know, we think there's great um, ex excellence in nonproliferation that could create value by a firm, you know, with respect to their reputation. If you had some kind of good housekeeping seal, the equivalent, to be able to show, you know, I'm going beyond what I need to be doing, and, and, and that, I, we think that was, could provide real value for companies. In fact, we've heard it from doing interviews. Um, and then this preferred access. Um, here, the idea is to secure the strategic commodity partnership network. If there's kind of this yellow pages, if you will, kind of, kind of the strong proliferation members, and they're part of this network, and they're doing a great job, you know, that could uh, make some sense. And then preferential sourcing. I mean, could the U.S. government get to a point where it could actually preferentially source from companies who are on some list of being above what's really required? Um, again, these are just ideas that we've thrown out. None of them have been really vetted. We've talked to folks in different parts of the U.S. government. We're just trying to get the conversation going. So in conclusion, I think I, and I, I definitely have heard it loud and clear that reputation matters. It's really important on many, many fronts for, um, for companies. I mean, we heard this in Seoul. I've heard it from lots of companies we've met with. Um, in fact, they'd rather have huge fines, but somehow make sure their reputation is maintained. And the nuclear suppliers, you know, they need to be responsible um, for security, and they need to, be, need to be thinking about the whole supply chain, not just the reactors, but all through that whole supply chain, in my mind. That's kind of, you know, that would be just amazing if we could get to that point. And there are different ways to do it. There's the sustainability approach that I've mentioned, the third party, but there are also these kind of competitive, these incentives that could be given to companies from doing so. So it's my challenge to have people to think about. But again, as Alan mentioned, I'd love to hear your questions and hear what more people have to say. So with that, I will close. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, we're gonna take a couple minutes break, get some coffee, some pastries, whatever we have over there, and then we'll come back for your questions and comments and a discussion session. Thanks. That was a pretty good segue, wasn't it? It was. <laughs>